Robert mm -hmm. Osborne, you have been on my bucket list forever. And now I am so thrilled to be here interviewing you. Oh my God, <laughs> is this good? <laughs> you wanna rub me yeah. out, is that it? Oh, okay. Who is on your bucket list? I did make a list of about the 50 people I most wanted to meet. And I think that out of that 50, and I had to meet them, like be introduced to them, not just see them or be in a room with them. But I think out of that 50, there are only about four that I missed. Deanna Durbin, who was living in, in Europe at the time, Garbo, I saw her, but I never met her, and a few others like that. But I did, I went to California at exactly the right time because they were all still around. The ones that I admired, the Barbara Stanwyck's and Betty Grable's and Lucille Ball's and Hedy Lamar's and Lana Turner's and all of that. And they were also not working so much. They were getting a little older. Their careers were not at their peaks anymore. And they liked somebody like me that knew their past because so many people didn't. It's, you know, back in that era, uh, once movies were shown in a theater, they were never shown again. In 1980, on a television program, you predicted that Meryl Streep, who hadn't even made Sophie's Choice yet, Meryl Streep would become this huge in-demand actress. Well, I used to be pretty good about that. I'm not sure I'm that good anymore. I don't quite, I think I understood the movie business better then than I do now. I think it's changed so much. It's so fragmented. There's no, uh, if, if I was starting out and trying to be an actor, I wouldn't have a clue how to begin, how you do it. Because there was, when I went to California in the late 50s and was there during the 60s and 70s and 80s, there was kind of a form that you took. You got a job at a studio, you worked your way up through the ranks, you learned your craft, uh, you would get hired if you were good. Um, you learned how to do things in a certain way. I don't think there's any formula anymore. You can be uh, do a YouTube now uh, song and get world famous. It doesn't mean you have anything to back it up that you can keep that fame going. Um, also, there's no studio form anymore. Movie studios now release films. They don't really make movies anymore. So therefore, everybody's out to make a big buck. So all the movies that you see opening on a Friday, all are basically the same movie. And it used to be that every studio, uh, there were like, you know, what, seven or eight major studios in California. Everybody made about 45 movies a year and they made like four film noirs, four musicals, three westerns, you know, uh, five dramas, uh, maybe one big spectacular movie. But that meant that any time you went to the movies, there was a great choice. Do you see any Meryl Streep's among today's current actresses? I think there are some out there, but again, it's very hard to define a career because you can be a Meryl Streep today or say a new Meryl Streep coming along. It doesn't mean that you're gonna get the properties that's going to help turn you into Meryl Streep because Meryl Streep became who she is by having really great scripts and really great directors working with her and really great opportunities for us to see how really talented and how versatile she is. And I'm not sure that, that somebody coming along today can guarantee that. Because you see a lot of those girls like Amy Adams, you know, she's just had a great run the last couple of years, but who knows what she's gonna be getting to do this year or next year. And you, the same with the fellows, you know, the uh, Bradley Coopers, he's kind of proven now he's not just a, you know, kind of a, a People Magazine Man of the Year, but he's like a good actor and all that. But will he get other opportunities to do that? One never knows. Among today's current movies, are there any that will become the classics of the future? I think that it's almost impossible to know when you see a film how well it will wear years later, how much in tune it will be with how you feel years later. I know there's so many movies that we see that are available on TCM that I watch that I didn't pay that much attention to before. And I see it now, I think, wow, that was really a good movie. It's a new favorite of mine. Uh, and I'd rather pass by it when it came out. And just the opposite, some movie I was just crazy about when I saw it. I look at it now and I think, well, that's, you know, that's not so interesting. You know, uh, today we don't, 
demand somebody. We don't go to the movies to see somebody that's as rare as an Audrey Hepburn or a Grace Kelly in To Catch a Thief or a Cary Grant. You know, uh, we want we want the the guy playing the taxi driver to look just like the cab driver that drove us around yesterday. We don't want people from another world. And it used to be you went to the movies to see beautiful people that were not like the people next door. You went to see Joan Crawford movies because she wasn't like everybody next door. Betty Davis, I mean, you wouldn't want to live next to Betty Davis, you know, but that's what made her so fascinating. But today, we want real people. We want them to be just like anybody you run into on the street. I've been a long time addict of TCM, love the movies. But even though I have covered movies for many years, I've learned so much from your commentaries. I found that the more I did find out about movies, particularly movies that maybe weren't so great, but find out maybe why they weren't so great or why they didn't do so well, the more interesting it was to me. So I always kind of felt that when I got this, this job at Turner, that you didn't have to sell Singing in the Rain or you didn't have to sell you know, uh, The Bandwagon or All About Eve or classic films. They had an audience already and they kind of spoke for themselves, but there were all those other movies. We, you know, in the Turner package that Ted Turner bought, 7,500 movies. So there are a lot of those movies that, with interesting people in them, if you know a little something going in about where Jean Harlow's career was at that time, what was going on in her life at that time, or what was going on at MGM Studios at that time, or what was going on in the relationship between Wallace Beery and Jean Harlow, who didn't like each other. Uh, you know, that if you know that going in, it makes watching the movie so much more interesting then. You have written, I believe it's 10 books that are the official histories of the Academy Awards. The history of the Academy Awards is kind of the history of sound movies because the first year of the Academy Awards in 1927 was, they were all silent films. The second year they were all basically sound films. So what, what you're getting is the history of the best of the sound movies. You have to take into consideration what was going on in the world at that time. And a good example is the year 1944. Right in the midst of the Second World War, there were uh, five films nominated, and two of them were from Paramount Pictures. One was Going My Way, a tale of a very simple, uncomplicated young priest in New York, played by Bing Crosby, having trouble you know, with the mortgage on a church and all that. It was a really charming, wonderfully upbeat, warm, humanistic movie. Another one of the nominees that year was Double Indemnity with Barbara Stanwyck and Fred McMurray, Edward G. Robinson, done by Billy Wilder, about these two really nasty people who join up to commit murder, to murder the lady's husband for his insurance policy. Now today, without doubt, maybe the classic film of that year was Double Indemnity. I mean, it still holds up so well. Brilliant movie, really wonderfully made. People don't pay much attention to going my way anymore. But at that time, in 1944, when there was a war going on and neighbors were getting killed, uh, the, you know, your, the next door neighbor's son, your uncle, whatever, you, you, you weren't that, you weren't that um, taken by a movie about two killers. You and Lucille Ball were great friends. What influence did she have on your life? She came into my life at such a great time. I had just come to California, and she, she um, was having marital problems. Her husband wasn't around much, and she put this contract group together at Desilu Studios because that had, that's how she had, at the same studios when it was RKO, that's how she'd become successful because Leela Rogers, Ginger Rogers' mother, was put in charge of all the contract players at RKO and really helped nurture these young players, including Lucy. And so she wanted to do the same when she owned the studio. So she had a group, but out of that group, there were about three of us uh, that really wanted to be in the business for a long time and be around it. And she recognized that. So she, she kind of took us under her wing and gave us what we would now say would be like a master class 
in how the business works. She'd get movies and many of her own television shows and show them, show them to us at home. And she'd point out why one show worked and another one didn't. She'd show how if she had to, I always think of, she had to play a, uh, a, a cello badly in one Lucy show, that if you, if, you, if you had to do that and be funny doing it, you first had to learn to play the cello correctly, and then you could play it badly. But you can't just go flail around and be funny. It has to be sharper than that. And there were just so many things that she taught us. And she said, you know, you could do this as an actor, but it's not going to make you happy. She said, you're, uh, you're not street smart like some kid from New York. You're from a small town in the state of Washington. And you can learn to be aggressive, and you can learn to be, uh, uh, and get more of an ego than you have now. But she said, that's not going to please you. She, she said, you love research, you love older films. And she said, we have enough actors, we don't have enough people writing about movies. That's what you should do. And she also said, the first thing you must do is write a book. She said, because if you show you have the discipline to sit down and write a book, if you go to get a job and there's somebody else who hasn't written a book, you'll get the job. What is your philosophy about your work and what you do? I think that to do anything well, you have to have passion about it. So I think you can't conjure up passion. If you have passion, you must follow it and do what you're passionate about. Um, I, I think I'm very lucky because I've always had this passion about the movies. I feel badly for people that I know that are of a certain age uh, getting up well into their 40s that still haven't figured out what they're passionate about. No matter how much you get knocked down in the process of following your dream or what you want to do, you have to realize there's an awful lot of luck involved in it. And you just, I think, have to have great hope that you have some luck thrown in there. Because my whole life has just been about luck. Because I, you know, there's no reason I should be working where I'm working or living in New York or appearing on television or anything because I, I don't come from a theatrical background at all. But I just think you have to go after it and just hope that you have some luck because luck is so much a part of it. There's so many people that know every bit as much as I do about older films and could certainly be doing what I do but I got lucky and I got the job. You have a film festival every year in Los Angeles in the spring and then in the fall you have the movie Cruise. You have one coming up in October. What are you going to have on the October Cruise? We have movies running all day from like nine in the morning until midnight in about four or five theaters on the ship and uh, a mix of films and we try to have a celebrities connected to those films sailing with us uh, to talk about the films. And then we have like uh, interviews with just the celebrity. Uh, we have Alex Trebek comes with us and does a, a Jeopardy game show. So it's great fun. Our film festival is on a bigger scale. That's for five days in Los Angeles. That encompasses about seven theaters and that's going day and night and that's gotten many, many celebrities connected. But we also recognize the fact that you haven't really seen a movie till you've seen it on a big screen in a theater with a lot of other people. And so that's what this is all about. Because you can see, uh, you can see A Star is Born with Judy Garland, but until you've seen Judy Garland in a theater with 2,000 other people and Judy Garland three stories tall singing The Man That Got Away, uh, that is a thrill like no other, and you can't get that on your television set at home, uh, even no matter how big your set is. So that's what this is all about, to see Casablanca on a big screen, because it's like a different movie. Um, so that's the thrill of it. So besides the, the famous movies, we also pick out movies that nobody really knows that are just great movies and introduce them to people like Dodsworth with Walter Houston and Ruth Chatterton, a wonderful William Wyler film. Um, so that's what it's all about. Robert Osborne, I believe that's a wrap. Now you can you dump me out of your bucket? <laughs> Is that what you're telling me? No. Oh. I can check you off oh, the okay. list.
but at the same time hoping that we will meet again. I hope so too. It would be my pleasure. Thank you so very, very much, Robert Thank you. Osborne. Thank you.